Very few people here. A couple said they couldn't come. Maybe a couple are coming late. We can profit if there are, well, there can't really be too many questions here because there aren't so many people. Also, if anybody on Zoom wants to ask any questions about anything earlier in the course, now's a good time. But today, I don't think I'll fill up the whole hour and a half anyway. I'll end, I expect to end a bit early, so there'll be time at the end if you have questions or favorite problems of your own and want to ask you know, if they'd be suitable subjects for any of the methods I've been talking about. So this is, as I said, and as you know, the last of the 12 uh, lectures of this course. The last three were on a very specific subject to quite complicated application of the circle method to sums of the partitions of a number as a sum of squares or cubes or higher powers. This is a much simpler problem, which was mentioned on the advertisement of the course and on the poster. And I'd said I didn't know if I would get to it. It depended on time and whether I could find my notes, which were either in China or in Germany or in Italy. And in fact, I never did find the notes. But I've, of course, I found all the computer calculations and spent a couple of days trying to sort it out. But I'm still not entirely sure. And the software has changed a little. And the computers are faster. I redid many calculations. So the numerical aspects may be a little vague. But it's a question of principle. And the question was, what, how do you sum numerically? So we had looked at how you sum numerically several kinds of sums, using euler maclaurin or using uh, take the partial sums and do an extrapolation by the method that you now know, multiply by power of n, take a difference and extrapolate. So we had various sorts of infinite sums. But today, I'm interested in a very slowly convergent sum. So I'll just call it. Uh, actually, I don't. I've already made a mistake in my notes. I call it H of X because uh, H stands for Hardy and Littlewood. This time, not Hardy and Ramanujan. And I actually don't know the reference where they mentioned this problem, but it was told me by my friend Hartmut Monin. Uh, and actually, we worked a little bit on this and on a related problem I might mention at the end, but in the end, uh, we didn't finish anything jointly. He wrote a paper with his method, and I'll say something about mine today. But he told me about the problem, and they gave this as an example of a function that's very, diff very easy to define, very easy to see that the sum converges, but very hard to compute numerically. And the question is, how do you actually compute it? So I've written it before on the board. It's this extremely simple. So again, it's not that this came up and it's important so far as I know for any application, but that it's kind of a test function, or at least that's how I understood it. Can one take such a series and actually compute it? So obviously, if, you know, if, if x is 0.1 or, or even 1, then there's no problem because this series obviously converges. Once k is bigger than x, sine of x over k is, well, it's always for every x, sine of x over k is O of x over k with a universal bound, like 2. And therefore, this series converges like 1 over k squared. So there, in that sense, there's no problem. But the problem is if x is very large. So in order to do that directly, you have to wait till the terms start getting small. And the terms only get small when k is much bigger than x. So if x is 1, it's not a big problem. If, if, even if k is 20, it's not a big problem. But if k is a million, you already have to take many more than a million terms before the terms even start to get 0. And then you still have to extrapolate. And if, k is very, if x is very large, uh, and we'll see very large numbers later, then it's completely hopeless. You can't begin to sum up to the order of x. So what we want to do is go to the order of x to the lambda plus some kind of a correction. So we want to compute a certain number of terms, of course, by hand, and then do something to predict how much is missing. And we also want an accuracy at the very end of uh, at the end, we would like an accuracy, which is, at the very least, asymptotic to all orders, which means it's bigger uh, than, as x goes to infinity, it's bigger than any fixed negative power of x. So that's the desideratum. And in theory, one of these plays off against the other. If you want more accuracy, you might need a lot more time. Of course, what we care about, then, is the time, maybe also the amount of memory, but especially the time. 
So if x is very large and lambda is 1, let's say, then this will be completely hopeless on the computer. If lambda is small, then maybe this correction term is very small. It will turn out I'm going to describe four different methods. For tagging this, it's more about giving ideas how one solves such a problem, and nobody really cares about this particular function. And it turns out in each case that the A is not very central. Once it works, once you can get 100 digits, you can also get 500 digits, and it only takes a little bit longer. What's important is the time, you know, how many terms you have to take at the beginning. That's the key parameter. So I'm going to show you, if the time permits, three methods, uh, well, four methods. The first one is lambda is approximately 1, 1 plus epsilon. So that's very bad if x is The second one, lambda, will be about a half. So it's still slow, but you can go much, much, much further. And the, the third, lambda, will be about a third. And the fourth, which is due to Monin, and that's the one that he showed me when we worked work on the other problem, lambda is, again, more like a half. So the most efficient numerically is the third way. But the, the method is very interesting, and so I want to show you that one, too. So I'm going to show you four different methods, you know, none of which, well, no, Monin's method is certainly by no means an obvious idea. And even the others, you know, they have a little bit of, of, of punch. So let's start with the um, first method is Taylor expansion. So in principle, this would work if I were summing not just this particular function, 1 over k sine x over k, but some other function uh, which has a nice Taylor expansion of the origin, such as sine does. But I'll, I'll just stick to this example. So if I just do it directly, but here I have to look at my notes, which are now in tech rather than printed, because there's so many formulas I didn't want to recopy them all. So the expansion of sine, as you know, is just the alternating sum over odd numbers of x to the n over n factorial. But here, it's not x to the n. It's x over k to the n. And then there's an extra 1 over k. So that's clear, of course. And so therefore, this is the same as the sum n from 1 to infinity, n odd again. So I'll just put minus 4 over n, because it's short. Remember, minus 4 over n is 0 if n is even. And if n is odd, it is minus 1 to the n minus 1 over 2. So that's the same. And the x to the n doesn't change. But of course, the sum, k to the n plus 1, I can just put inside and sum. And now, because the n is odd, so n plus 1 is even, so this is just a Bernoulli number times, uh, times the power of pi. And luckily, there, it starts at n equals 1, so we start at z of 2, z of 0, or z of 1 wouldn't be such a good idea. And actually, the Bernoulli numbers has an alternating sign that conveniently uses up this stupid sign. And then we have 2 pi x to the 2n, 2 pi x to the n. So this is an exact formula. And of course, I haven't done at every stage. Everything was convergent, absolutely convergent. This last formula is an exact series. It's obviously rapidly convergent, because a is O of 1. Uh, and so this is like x to the n over n factorial. But as you know, and I've discussed before, if you want to compute, for instance, e to the x, where x is minus 1,000 by the alternating sum minus 1,000 to the n over n factorial, you need very, very high accuracy. Because first, you need a lot of terms. And also extremely high accuracy, because the biggest terms are huge. And they cancel. And the final number is very small. And here, it'll be a bit the same. It's not very small. But it's much smaller than the biggest terms. So you need, if you do this directly when x is large, it's not a good idea. However, it is always correct. Now, I'll, I'll say words in a minute about the numerics, but first I want to tell you a general idea that's extremely useful. So imagine that you have a sum, you have some sum of some a n, and you want to know what it is. But let's say that a n individually is defined as the sum of some b n m. So in other words, this is a, uh, this is a table of numbers b n m. And you happen to know how to solve some any column in closed form. And you get a n. So then you can redo this. And then, of course, you could say that this also is the sum of the cm. So in other words, what I'm saying is if a n is the sum over m of b n m, then the sum over n if a n is the double sum, which is also the sum of cm. And so sometimes, if you're lucky, you can sum both the rows and the columns of the infinite table. Then you'll get a non-trivial identity. That the original sum, which is the one you want, is this new sum. And that's exactly what I did here. I expanded sine as an infinite sum 
interchanged, and then I could do the inner sum. But it means really I have a double sum. And so a thing that, and I, I realized this years ago because I do so many numerical calculations, it's obvious. But for a long time, and I've noticed other people often do this, I would just say you either use this sum or you use that sum. If one is better, well, you've gained something. If it's worse, you've lost something. But you shouldn't do either one, because if you think for what you really have, I mean, all of these numbers are calculable, just you don't want to have to calculate infinitely many. So you have a big sum. And so one way is that this one is known. Let's say this sum is A1, A2, A3. And these sums are also known if you sum all the way to infinity. This would be C1, C1, C2, and C3. And so you could say, if I want the whole sum of everything, I take all the Cs, or I take all the As. But what you should do is what you actually want to do is you take all B and M with N. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take N less than or equal to some N. So I'm going to take the first capital N rows. But I don't just stop with that. And stop because what I'm throwing away, let's say I take the first 10 rows. Then I'm throwing away all the terms to the right of that. And some of them are way down here. They may be very insignificant. So I don't want to do that. So I take the first capital N, where I have to choose N and M conveniently. I choose the first capital N, A, M, and the first capital M of the B and M. And I do both. So I don't make a choice. Am I, uh, so this would be C, M in my notation. So I don't take just, for instance, these three rows and these four rows. I take these three rows and these fourth rows. And now I say, what I got is the whole sum. Well, I'm missing this part, except I've counted this doubly. And so the price you pay is that you have to remove the sum where both things are true. Because if you have a pair n m, and n is less than or equal to capital N, and m is less than or equal to capital N, then you've counted it twice. So you have to remove that. So the price you pay is, let's say you've removed 100 lines here and 100 here. Well, 100 terms is, only, is nothing on the computer. But 100 times 100 is 10,000. That's already 100 times slower. So the price you pay is that instead of having single sums, you've also got a double sum. But the, what you gain is that the actual error is now you've only left out the terms that are bigger than both n and m. And that's often very, very much smaller. So it's often the case that this sum converts fairly slowly. But the main contribution to the first row you left out is from the very bottom and the next one. And so if you keep a lots of bottoms, and sometimes you don't have to say both of these numbers are very big. One of them might be only you know, five, and the other might be 200. And then it doesn't matter taking five. But if you have two big numbers, then as I say, you pay a price. So here, this is, as I already said, an exact formula. There's nothing wrong with it. It converges and for any x, but so does the original series. So if this is convergent for any x, and so is this. So in that sense, we've gained nothing. And you could, of course, look at the speed of convergence. They're completely different. Well, this is always 1 over x squared. But the, the O constant is horrible. It's x over x squared. And x is very large. This is something with factorial. But still, if x is large, bn is like n factorial. So this is like 1 over n factorial, as you can see here. But now we can combine them. And so it's, that's exactly the trick. If I take a better approximation, so th this sum, if I just stop at capital N, I could call the nth approximation. So now if k and n are two numbers, like my m and n there, I can make the approximation where I take the original sum, uh, sine of x over k over k. So this is the one that I'll always be using. Let's just call that hk of x. You simply truncate the sum after k. And if k is extremely large, of course, you get the right answer. But it has to be so large that it's useless. So we take this, and then just as I said before, we add the terms. Now I'll double the n's. So I don't have to put the odd. I don't want to waste terms that are 0. So now the n factorial has become 2n minus 1 factorial. And now I take z of 2n, which you can compute either with the Bernoulli number or as a zeta function. But now you take away the beginning of that sum. So that's just what I said there. This one, if k went to infinity, sorry, this would also be, uh, this is now to n. And this is k from 1 to k. Sorry, I'm sleepy. So here we're taking the first k columns and the first n rows, and then we're subtracting n times k terms where I have both. So this is much better in principle. And now you can make an actual estimate. I'll do it quickly because. Who cares? 
but still you can now estimate the difference. So this is now the sum, as already said, n is bigger than n and k is bigger than k. I can drop all the signs for doing absolute value. And let's say it's always going to be positive. So it's this sum. And now the sum over n, oh, sorry, the sum over k is very easy. It's just 1 over k to the 2n. Uh, and you can easily do that. And it's 1 over k to the 2n minus 1. But we already have an x to the 2n minus 1. So it's x over k to the 2n minus 1 divided by 2n minus 1. because. This is like a geometric series. It's a little worse. You lose the 2n minus 1. That's nothing. The big one is the 2n minus 1 factorial. So this is the estimate there. And then you can keep going with this estimate here. You can estimate this rather easily as 2n cap capital N plus 1 over 2n plus 1. The details don't matter at all, but I'll write them out because it's not very long. This, and then there's still the factor, which is quite harmless. And now, if you assume that k times n is bigger, so that, I mean, I did this long ago, and I didn't check it again. These are just all more or less trivial estimates. But now you have to use Sterling. And you see that this thing is roughly 2n over e to the 2n. And so I want roughly 2n over e to be comparable with x over k. So you want roughly that kn is e x over 2. So that's bad news, because k times n well, it's not really bad news. That's the number of terms that you're, you're duplicating. And so that's going to be O of x terms. And that's independent of what k and n are, whether k is very small and n is very big or vice versa. This method always contains a rectangle with k n terms. And k n, as we just saw from this, just from Sterling, has to be roughly bigger than a constant times x. And so that's why I said this method is O of x. So if x is large, it'll be rather hopeless. But if you do assume that, then in this domain, what you find is ex over 2n to the power 2n plus 1. And then there's a stupid uh, power n to the 3 halves. And if I did it correctly, 39, just put together some junk. But roughly, it's, so if this number is less than 1, it's exponentially good, which is great. I mean, if n is big, it's exponentially small. But that's the error. But we don't want just a small error. I told you small error is easy. We want fast time. And that's very bad, because it's xk. So let me give you some, just a little bit of numerics, how this works. So this is the worst method, but it's the naive method. It works perfectly well. And you get the exact formula. And I did want to make this comment about double sums, because that's useful you know, lots and lots of times as a general thing. Once you've seen it, it's obvious. But many people, of course, know it. I'm not saying it's new. But many people don't think and just take either this sum or that sum, rather than taking both and then subtracting the overlap. So here are numerical values. So if x is 1, remember, the function is this. Uh, I should write the definition once again. Sine of x over k over k from 1 to infinity. That's our function h of x. So if I want h of 1 to 500 decimals, then there's a playoff, as already said. You can take k to be 0. So that's the original method. I just take this. Or I can take k to be 1. It's already quite good, because when you subtract just 1, from z of 2n, it's already 2 to the minus 2n. It's already a lot better. And that costs very little. And so here I took a couple of sample times, but with very small k. And as you'll see in a second, it made. So here, each time, I took the number of terms that I needed to get 500 digits. Okay, And it turned out if k was 0, I needed 105. If k was 2, I needed fewer. But as you see, the product kn is actually getting bigger. So it's a little. That part is worse. On the other hand, the calculation times are very big. The time in all three cases is almost the same. It's a tenth of a second. So it's, that's, of course, easy. Uh, and any method you use, you'll be able to compute h of 1. But if you take x to be 1,000, that's already a little less stupid. And again, if I want, so here's k and n. And I'm going to do it first with only 50 digits, then 100. And then 1,000, so I have different desiderata, how many terms I want. And here, if my table is right, it was 0. So if k is 0, I need now 1,415 terms, a lot more. If k is 1, I only need half. If k is 2, I need 506. If k is 8, I need 200. 
and if k is 23, I only need 100. So indeed, if you take a bigger k, you have a smaller n. But in fact, the time is always about the same. Uh, the time here is about 0.4 seconds, whichever of these you take. So sorry, this is k and n for these various accuracies. For 100 decimals, the corresponding numbers, uh, it's actually not that, well, 100 isn't all that much bigger than, I don't know why I took two numbers that are so close, 1786, the numbers are very simple, 6400, it's the same. Now it takes you know, uh, 0.5 seconds, it's almost the same. And when you want 1,000 digits, it now takes three seconds. So it's you know, eight times as long. And now the choices that worked, again, to get a feeling, if, if you want k to be zero, you now need more than 2,000 terms the other way. If you take one, you only need 1,479. If you take two, you need 1,190. If you take seven, you need 800. And if you take 60, then you only need 400. But to make up for it, you have 60, which is a lot bigger. And all of these take about the same time. So the moral of the story is there's not much in it. You don't really gain anything by fooling around with k and n. And in fact, since they're all the same time, you can just take k to be 0 or maybe 1 or 2, a very small k just to, to remove the leading term. So that was uh, slightly instructive, not very exciting. And we could do 1 trivially, and we could do 1,000 to even 1,000 digits in you know, 3 seconds if you needed a slightly bigger number, you know, maybe 10,000, it would still work, but you wouldn't want to go to a very big number. So now, that, as I said, is the lambda is one method, and we saw that the number of terms, the kn, has to be at least a constant times x, so that's really O of x, the calculating time. Even assuming the individual calculations are instantaneous, there's still O of x of them. It takes at least O of x time. Now, the second method is the one that I've discussed at the beginning of the course in detail, Oil and McLaurin, but it, it looks a little different here from the way it looks in general because of the same, same thing. So what we're going to do is we'll write h of x minus this abbreviate. Remember, h k of x is just the sum up to k. So this was the sum from k plus 1 to infinity, the sine of x over k over k. And by Euler and McLaurin, that will be to some very high degree of approximation the integral of that function, which is the sine integral, so s of t, it's called the sine integral, it's a standard function. I'll say in a minute how you calculate it, but s of t is just the integral from zero to t sine u over u du. Again, that's not very, if t is very large, you don't want to do that directly because it's, it's inefficient, but there are ways. I'll write in a minute what you can do for s of t, but anyway, that's the sine integral. And take that to be known, that, that you can compute very quickly. And then there are, this sign is the imaginary part of e to the ix over k. It's, it's easy to work with that. And so if you use, so remember Euler-McLaurin tells you that the sum from k plus 1 to infinity of any reasonable function f of k is roughly the integral from k to infinity of the same function, f of t dt, plus the sum, I won't get the signs right if I don't look, the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial times the nth derivative of k. OK, that's what euler mclaurin tells you. So here, when you do that, of course, we know the euler mclaurin expansion of everything, the power series. And when you work it out, what you get is the following mess. It's a double sum, but each term is elementary. It's r plus s factorial over r factorial s factorial squared, r plus s plus 1 and the Bernoulli number with index r plus s plus 1. And then it's e to the i x over k. So that would give you sine or cosine, because I'm going to have in a second a power of i. So here, depending whether s is even or odd, this is either plus or minus 1 or plus or minus i. So you'll get sines and cosines. So this is an infinite sum. And it, in fact, diverges. So you don't want to go all the way to infinity, but this is as an asymptotic series. So first of all, how do you compute s of t? That's not interesting. I'll just say very recently, roughly, s of t, you can do to any order. Well, I'll just write the thing. You just try um, the, the value at infinity is pi over 2. And then what's left by successive integration by parts is a standard asymptotic series. And it's divergent, of course, because the coefficients there 
ultimately plus or minus, well, not quite ultimately in period four, but the coefficient is k factorial, as you can see. It's 1, 1, 0 factorial, 1 factorial, 2 factorial, 3 factorial. So it's an asymptotic series, but if t is large, this uh, converts to very, I mean, you stop optimal truncation, like I discussed earlier, you get a very good value. But there's another trick. Uh, if you're using Paris, as I do, then this error is uh, the incomplete gamma function. And Paris, and, and presumably also Mathematica, and Maple, and lots of programs, have that pre-programmed, so you just call it. And it's intelligently programmed, at least in Paris, so even if t is huge, it does it the right way. And it gives you the right answer to whatever precision you have. So this we can think of as, as simply a known number. And this is asymptotic. And each term is easy. And so if I take five terms of this, that's a very simple correction. If I take 500 terms, it, it takes a little bit of time. But of course, the main thing is how far I have to go in k to make this good, because the slow part is this. This part is fast, and this is very fast. This is the slow part. So now if you analyze that, I have a lot of numerical examples, and I think I'll skip most of the details. In my example, I took x to be 10 to the 10. That's much, much bigger than we were able to take here. I was looking at x is 10 to the 3. So now x is 10 to the 10. And I actually, in my various calculations, I took k to be 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, and all the way up to 10 to the 8. But this one, if I did 150 digits, now I have to find the numbers up to 10 to the 5th. This took 0.7 seconds. This took seven seconds, this took 70, and this took 700, so 12 minutes. I mean, it's, it's just proportional to k, because each calculation is the same. It's just a sign of some random number, modulo 1. So, but, it, but then I want to go to much higher precision. For 1,000 digits, it already takes more time. This takes 14 seconds, and this one takes 140. Of course, I could have done one more. But it turns out you don't need to. You only have to go to k slightly bigger. In fact, it turns out even with 10 to the fifth, it works fine. I didn't believe that when I started. I was taking much bigger k. Because originally, I was taking like five or eight terms of this correction term. And then I was getting hundreds of digits with a very large k by computing, for instance, 100 million terms of the original sum. But here, I'm only computing 100,000 terms. That takes almost no, well, you can see here, 14 seconds, even to high precision. And now, if you take enough terms, it turns out that here, so I won't give all of the numbers, but with 10 to the fifth, if I took plus 400 terms, 400 pairs RS, I just ordered them in some way and take the first 400, that took another 12 seconds. And if I took uh, 500 extra terms, that took 26 seconds. So if you add that to the 14 seconds, we're talking less than a minute, and this gave already 320 digits correctly, and this already gave 400, more than 400 digits. So if you want, and you can get more, so even with this small k, that's both for k equals, with k is 100,000. If you take k to be a million, then this takes 140 seconds, but the other part uh, takes only a few seconds, like eight seconds, and you get the same accuracy. So it's a simple, it's a certain interplay, but it's actually more efficient, the total time, to take a smaller k and do the correction more carefully. So you're perfectly happy here with k roughly the square root of x. And here we easily got 400 terms. And if you wanted you know, 1,000 terms, it would work. And one could take x to be bigger than 10 to the 10. But you couldn't take it very, very much bigger, because this method still is like the square root of x. The first method was like x, and so x had to be very much smaller. OK, so those are the first two methods and a little bit about the numerics. Now comes the third method, which would be generic for any problem of this sort. And it's about x to the 1 third. So in other words, you have to take k in the third method. So the third method, maybe I'll start a new column. The third method is uh, sums over short intervals. So remember what we're doing. We have a function which, at the beginning, is essentially a random number over k, right? Because this, the numerator is sine of x over k. Sine is 10 to the 10. You divide by 1, 2, and 3, and reduce modulo 2 pi. It's a completely random number. 
So you, there's no kind of regular behavior. The function you know, is doing at the beginning, the small values are just jumping around. They're order of 1 over k, but that's all you can say of them. But if you go very, very, very far, then eventually it becomes a smooth function. And so what we did now is we stopped up to k, and we estimated the sum from k to infinity in one swell foop, or one, uh, I don't know what the correct English for that is. That's kind of slang. But we did it in one step using Euler-Maclaurin. But what if we took the difference, some kind of Euler-Maclaurin, but a little more intelligent in a much shorter interval, and broke up the remaining piece? So we're going to go up to some big K, but we're hoping only X to the roughly one third, so much smaller than before. This has to be by hand. The beginning terms you have to do by hand because they're completely random. You can't predict random numbers. But then we're going to divide up the interval into lots of short interval where it's already reasonably smooth and make an approximation of the terms, and then that uh, take a lot of intervals that get you out far enough that it works. So again, I'm only going to sketch this. It, it, the details are, in none of the cases, are interesting. If somebody really cares and has a problem that they want to think, they can, of course, ask me by email. But I'm just trying to illustrate different methods and give a little bit of numerical results. So the idea is, in, in each short interval, but of course, it's not really short because I'm starting. Uh, my x, I can already tell you, is going to be 10 to the 60 for this example, so much bigger. And so even x to the 1 third is 10 to the 20. So, the, you know, I've, sorry, that can't be right. I can't have gone up to 10 to the 1 third, 10 to the 20 by hand. So I don't know quite what I did. Actually, now I'm a little worried with the 1 third because I know it was 10 to the 60. But Uh, I can't have actually done 10 to the 60. I think I only did the, the short terms and I did some with smaller x. I could certainly do like 10 to the 30 in a reasonable time in the computer. But the idea is in short interval, you estimate the, the sums. So you make some kind of an expansion of the sum end. It's a sum of pure powers. And each pure power is just an exponential function times, so it's either x to the i in some interval, which is an arithmetic sequence, or i x to the i, or i squared x to the i. It's a small derivative of a, of a geometric sequence. And each of those can be solved in closed form. And that's what we'll do. And that get, gives you the exact contribution of that to the whole interval. You don't have to sum anything. You just subtract the value at the beginning and at the end. So you estimate the sum as a, a, a combination, the contribution, as a sum of generalized arithmetic sequences, arithmetic progressions. Oh, sorry, not arithmetic, excuse me, geometric series. So let me define. So G0 of AN, so in actually the ones we're going to have, A is going to have absolute value 1. And GJ, you'll see in a second, will be, well, I'll just write the, I can find it already. Gj of a and n will be the sum n from 0 to uh, n minus 1, the way I'm doing it, n to the j, a to the n. So that's what we want. a is going to, in practice, be in a number of absolute value 1, or maybe very near to 1, and we're summing this. So let's start with uh, g0 of a n is just 1 plus a up to a to the n minus 1. And of course, we all learned this in school. I'm assuming a isn't exactly 1 then this is a to the n minus 1 over a minus 1. So this is an exact formula. So no matter how big your interval is, you can do that one in closed form. Similarly, g1 of a n, well, it's 0 plus a plus 2a squared up to n minus 1, a to the n minus 1. Of course, that we also learned in school how to do, and I'll write out the first three formulas, this one, this one, and the next one because it's not quite obvious how to proceed. So it's, there's a term with n, and there's a term without any n. And up to constants, depending on a, it's always a linear combination of a to the n and 1. So this is a to the n minus 1. This is just a to the n, but there's the n. And similarly, if I take g2 of a n, so that'll be a plus 4a squared up to n minus 1 squared, a to the n minus 1. Uh, I'm running out of space. I'll put it here. This is now a term with n squared. n squared times a to the n over a minus 1. 
then minus 2, so binomial coefficient, 2 times n times a to the n plus 1 over a minus 1 squared. And the last term has no n anymore, but it's more complicated in a, a times a plus 1 over a minus 1 cubed. And then times what we'd expect, a to the n minus 1. So if you look at these three formulas, it's clear that you could find the formula for the fourth and the fifth power, you know, each individual one, but it's a pain in the neck. So when I did this, I worked out, I'm sure this is standard, but it's kind of cute how you get these numbers. And it turns out some the computer we're going to want, let's say, the first 20 of these. So the sum with n to the 0, n to the 1, up to n to the 19, let's say. So I'm always going to want a whole vector. And it turns out it's more efficient to compute them all uh, rather than one at a time. Well, I don't have to put four numbers, but in the matrix, I'll put four because it's a little confusing. And I'm going to go to some point j. I'm going to compute this whole matrix. And so I'm going to have a new matrix. It's the following, a minus 1, and then 0, 0, 0. It's a triangular matrix. The next column will be a, and then a minus 1. The next will be a, 2a, a minus 1, and 0. OK? The next will be a, 3a, 3a, and a minus 1. So it's pretty obvious. These are just the binomial coefficients times always a. In the last term, we subtract 1. And so the very last will be a, j over 1, a, j over 2. Uh, if I do it, if I put it in nice rows, I guess this would be here, j over 1, a. Then here, it's j over 2, a over 3a, and the last term again will be a minus 1. Well, if you look at that, you say, well, that's ridiculous if it's that easy. Oh, sorry, and I have to put what this matrix is. It's a vector. I have to multiply this by something. It's a to the n minus 1, n a to the n, n squared a to the n, n cubed a to the n, down to n to the j a to the n. So if you look at that, you'd say, oh, that's ridiculous. Then why write the whole thing? The bottom row is just this simple sum, but of course it's not. Uh, there's an inverse. You have to take that matrix and invert it. It's not very hard because it's triangular. But when you do that, you get more and more complicated terms. But of course, your computer will trivially compute this, this matrix and then trivially compute its inverse. So that's the formula. And as I said, when you actually want to do it, you decide in advance how big your j is, like 20. And you're going to have a lot of different a's. And so you don't compute this numerically each time. That's what you usually do if you have something with letters. You compute numerically each time. You compute this in closed form for your given j, like 20, as a combination of you know, these a to the n's. And once you've done that, you get a closed form, and you can just substitute uh, any a into that form instantly. So OK, so that's how you get the gj. And now we have to come, come to the point. How does that help us? So now, as I said, we're talking about a short interval. I see that I'm, unless I really drag things out. Well, no, I still have the fourth method to do. So here's the lemma. So for any k bigger than n bigger than 0, and x and c, I'm not even sure if I need k bigger than n, but probably I do. I'm going to take the, the sum over what I call the short interval, which of course means a long interval, but relatively short. So I'm going to take n terms starting at k. And k will be very large. And n will be large, but not nearly as large. So I'll have a long interval. But the idea is I won't care how large n is, even if it's a trillion, because I'm going to make this re, uh, approximate the sum by a finite number of these things with the same n. And each of these is given in closed form. So whether n is 1 or 1,000, you can compute this instantly. You aren't actually adding up n terms. So the idea is to have actually very big numbers. In fact, I'm not quite convinced by the numbers of what I did, but these were days of computation. I didn't have time this week to redo them, so I have to trust them and hope that everything's correct. But anyway, let me, so in the examples I'll give later, I don't know why I took quite such a small n and quite such a big k. It seems like not such a good idea, but maybe it is. So it's the same sum that we're talking about. And now it's going to be, well, then originally it's simply an exact formula, because it'll actually be convergent if everything I did is correct. So it's going to be the exact sum, the imaginary part, of e to the ix over k. 
So that'll be, have some sine or cosine. And then it'll be the sum over all pairs of integers p and l greater than or equal to zero, and then a bunch of stupid factors. Binomial coefficient p plus l over l minus one to the l over p factorial, and then i x to the p over k to the power of three p plus l plus one. And then the same function g, j of a and n that I already defined, so the j will be two p plus l, so if my p and l are going up to you know, 10 or so, this will be a reasonably small index. And then as I already told you, the n will be n, and the a will be the same number that I had, except now it's i x over k squared, n. But again, I don't really care what these numbers are, because once p and l are fixed and n is fixed, this thing can be computed in a small amount of time. So this series, uh, it's, it, it works very rapidly, so you take a relatively small number of terms of this using these exact formulas that you get by inverting that matrix, and that's the answer. So actually, since it's not terribly hard and not entirely obvious, let me quickly do this because the method would work once again for any other function. There's nothing, not all that much to do with, well, it, it does use the sign. So I'm going to, so the proof is for any n in this range, so n goes from 0 to n minus 1. I'm going to, this k is now going to be k plus n. So I'm going to take e to the power i x over k plus n and divide by k plus n. And then at the end, then 1 take the imaginary part in either order and secondly sum over n between 0 and n minus 1. Okay. So this is the sum end we want. And so I just express this. And now the idea is the n is going to be much smaller than k. So to, or, to leading order, this is 1 over k. And the remaining term is going to be a geometric series in n over k, which I can just multiply out. Okay. Then I'll have the e to the i x over k, because k is big. n, remember, k is much bigger than, than capital N, and therefore much bigger than little n. So this i x over k plus n is roughly i x over k, which I could even take out, but it's actually convenient to leave it. But then I expand 1 over k plus n as the beginning of a geometric series. So the next term has a k, k squared, uh, n over k squared. So the next term is e to the minus x over k squared to the n. And that's where I'm going to use my lemma, because it's the nth power of something of absolute value n. So what I'm using is that 1 over k plus n is equal to 1 over k minus, I guess, n over k squared plus whatever's left, which is the, the, the part that's left, which is therefore e to the i x n squared over k squared times k plus n. But here I can't do the trick again. Of course, here, this is, here I'm perfectly happy to do is this little k, this was actually a big k, so it should have been, it doesn't matter. So this will be k squared times k plus n, and this will be, I guess, plus n squared. The problem is I can't do it again, because the next time I'll have a sum with something to be n squared. Nobody knows how to do that in closed form. So the idea is this is a constant. You can just take it out. This is the nth power. You can sum it in closed form. This is a square, but it means that now you only need roughly n squared, maybe comparable to k cubed. That's where the, where the 3 comes in. So that's the, that's the little trick. So this is the key idea of the, of the proof. I don't want to remove the lemma, so I better not cross it out. So now if, if I expand that, so the e to the ix over k just comes out. The 1 over k also comes out. This thing to the nth power comes out. And the final exponential I'm going to write out as an infinite exponential. It's 1. So this last exponential is the sum 1 over p factorial i n squared x over k cubed now. Because this, remember, is k cubed times 1 plus n over k. So now I get k cubed. That's why k cubed will compare with x. And then I'll have 1 plus n over k to the minus p except I already had a 1 plus n over k, so it becomes minus p minus 1. But that's no more expensive than 1 over p. So now we're nearly there, uh, namely this one. You just expand as the sum l greater than or equal to 0 
of L plus P over L times N over K uh, to the L. I hope it's maybe minus, maybe it's my, I'll get the signs from minus N over K to the L, and then that is the double sum that I said. Okay, so here we have the sum over P and L with some power K to the L, I hope I got it right, and here K to the 3P plus one. Anyway, when you do it all, you get just that, but what you're left with is the sum of a pure nth power, and so that's what gives these interesting G. So that's the, that's the method. And so there are some, there's some discussion here about how to choose things optimally, and I'm not even sure I really believe it, so I'll skip it, uh, that but roughly it will come out x to the one-third, I hope. But in my example, actually, I did take x to the one-third. I'm really puzzled. Uh, so I took the interval from 10 to the 30, so 10 to the 6. So 10 to the 30 is way too big. I cannot go up to 10 to the 30 by hand. However, what I did here is still reasonable. My x is 10 to the 60. That's my target. I'm going to do up to a certain point by hand, and then I'm going to cut off the rest in lots of so-called short intervals. And one of the, those short intervals will go all the way from x to the roughly a third or maybe less, all the way up to infinity. And so one of them might be this one. This is the interval from 10 to the 30 up to 10 to the 30 plus a million, which is you know, very, very small compared to 10 to the 30. So the numbers are hardly changing, which is why I can do this approximation of a smooth function by its constant term, its linear term, its quadratic term, without losing too much. OK, so, that's, so in this numerical example, I took these values. And then I can again fill in some of the actual numbers. So the sum, so here, the sum, so for these numbers, uh, this sum, this sum is approximately uh, 2.6 times 10 to the minus 31. So the total contribution in this interval is very small anyway. Remember, it's already 1 over k, and the signs are essentially random. So on the average, they tend to cancel out. But the individual terms would actually be much bigger than, I mean, it's not, you know, they aren't a, a millionth of this, they're of the same order. So you have that. And now if you do it, directly. So if I do this particular case, it's only a million terms. So Paris can do this perfectly easily. This was several years ago, so probably it would be much faster now. This took, if I simply added up these terms, it was two and a half minutes, which is not huge. But remember, we're only taking a little infill of length a million. We have a zillion of those to get up to 10 to the 6. So we have a huge number. So, but still, it's two and a half minutes. But if you take the terms but the terms of, of the lemma, just the ones with 2p plus l, which is the key parameter, up to 10. So that's you know, like 50 terms. Then that takes, uh, takes, and this was 10 years ago, so now it'd be faster. It took eight milliseconds instead of two and a half minutes. So that's a hell of a gain. And it gives, for this number, which is 10 to the minus 31, it gave 110 digits of accuracy. So we aren't losing anything. So in other words, this method over short intervals is extremely efficient, gives very, very accurate answers in a very, very short time. But the price, once again, is you, you need a lot of short intervals. And of course, you still need your original k to be large, because all of this depended on k being bigger than n, and preferably, well, a lot better to make these things. Well, though this is exact. It doesn't matter here. I'm about to say, I haven't yet said, so I can't remind. I'm, all I said now is this is an exact formula so long as n is less than k. This is exact. Then I gave an example. If I chose the interval with x is 10 to the 60, from 10 to the 30 to 10 to the 30 plus a million, then the sum by direct computation, it's about 10 to the minus 31. It takes three minutes. If I use the first 50 or so terms of this, it takes a a hundredth of a, less than a hundredth of a second and gives up more than 100 digits. And I can take a few more terms and get more. So getting just this interval is very fast. But now I want to get the whole sum. I have to say how I choose the intervals. And that's the last part. So indeed, that's, uh, I still absolutely owe you that. So in practice, if I can trust my notes. So this was only an example how you would do it for a single interval, 10 to the 60. But I think I cannot 
pretend to the 6 to actually give you the number, because the k, I certainly can't go up to 10 to the 30 by hand. But even 10 to the 20, which would be the cube root, that would be you know, a year or two on the computer. I mean, it's out of the question. So, but you probably could go to 10 to the 30. But this is correct to show you how a single interval works. And so it's convincing. So in practice, so this is the last part of, of the third method. To calculate h of x, where x is large, we first calculate directly h uh, k0 of x, which remember was just the sum from, from 1 to k0 of sine x over k over k, where k0 is, let's say, the integer part, or it's roughly, well, we can take the integer part. You pick a lambda which is a, a third or slightly bigger than a third, is what I decided at the end was up, and whether I was correct. I, do, I tried to do it carefully at the time, but I wasn't able to reconstruct the calculation. I didn't have my handwritten notes. I just have the notes I didn't tech, and I, I just didn't have the time this week. It's m several days of work to check all of this, and I didn't do it. So let's hope that I did it correctly. So we first do this by hand. And that's the one that already tells you it's one, th one third, which is better than the previous for one and a half. But it still means if x is 10 to the 60, it's too big. 10 to the, but it, you might do it for 10 to the 30 or 10 to the 25, which is still much better than before. So now you calculate, you take the intervals where k goes from this k0. And I'll put 1 plus some small number, which I called eta rather than epsilon. So here the eta is going to be small, and I'm going to take, I decided this was optimal, I'll take intervals, but multiplicative. I, I don't take fixed intervals of fixed length. The further out you go, so it grows exponentially. It's 1 plus roughly log x over x to the lambda. I mean, it obviously doesn't matter if you take 2 log x over x to the lambda, but it should be a little bigger than x to the lambda, not too much bigger. Okay, And the j goes from 1 up to roughly cx to the lambda with the same lambda, about a third, and c is of the order of 1. So it means we have the x to the lambda twice. We already have x to the lambda terms. And here, there's no point having fewer or more, because the bottleneck is whichever one is bigger. And both are elementary com computations, so you might as well take them of the same general order. And that gives, that's the one that forces you to take a third to make it work. So now what we have is one sum exactly up to k0. Then we have a lot of these short intervals up to k0 times 1 plus a to the whatever it is, cx to the j. And then with the, the tail. And then the tail, you have uh, two. So you either use Euler-Maclaurin as we did the first time. Remember, once it was very, very far off, you could use Euler-Maclaurin. Or depending how far you went, you simply ignore it. It actually turned out numerically you could do this method. It was quite fast so far that by then the tail was, was smaller than the error that you were making anyway. You could just drop the tail. So in other words, you could use this morally all the way to infinity and stop when it comes too small. But you can also stop earlier and do it by euler mclaurin But that's more work because you have to work out all the formulas and, and don't make mistakes and checks with several. What's good in all of these methods, this is, I've said this before in this course, the most important thing when you're computing is knowing that you aren't making mistakes. You get numbers to 1,000 digits, great. Your computer will always print out 1,000 digits. If they aren't the correct 1,000 digits, it's not much use. And nobody can look at them. If we knew the answer, we wouldn't be doing it. So it's very important in every problem of this that there are free parameters. Here there are several. How do I choose the 8? I can put 2 log x or 1.3 log x. How do I choose the lambda? You change many things, and you do it independently. And then if the two things exist to 500 decimals, it's not a proof of anything, but you know morally that you've got 500 decimals. So it's very important that we have free parameters and that we have choice in how we choose them. If there's a unique method and you say, do exactly this, it might be proven, but you still might make a mistake. It's, it's very worrying. So it's always better to have, have this. So these are the two methods. And as I said, the experiments with Paris showed that the accuracy is what I said at the beginning, is some negative power of A with any A, and the A hardly played any role. So in a reasonable amount of time. But the time, which means the number of steps, is roughly x to the 1 third plus epsilon as opposed to x to the 1 plus epsilon and 1 half plus epsilon that we had before. 
So this is the most efficient. It's also the ugliest because we've broken up into different pieces. But still this idea that if you have a smooth function that we all know that a smooth function in a short interval is roughly its constant value. And that more accurately, it's linear. That we all learn. But of course, to higher accuracy, it's the, the oscillating parabola. And then to yet higher accuracy. And so the idea is the linear part, if you have an e to the ix over or some lambda to the n, you can sum in closed form. And the rest, you can expand as a power series uh, here of e to the x. And if you do that, you, you gain one, one power. So here, the one half became one third. OK, so those are the three methods that, uh, that I was using. And the fourth method I said at the beginning is actually a little less efficient uh, for this particular problem, because it's back to lambda as a half. But it's very interesting. This is the method that uh, Monin was using for a different problem that we both looked at. And at the end, he had a, a much better approach. And uh, I sort of dropped out of the project. His paper came out 12 years ago or so. Uh, so I'll mention that problem. Also, oh, I still have lots of time for the fourth method. So the fourth method is, I, I already said the name, Hartmut Monin, who's a physicist, but, well, I mean, he's a physicist. He's a very good physicist, but he's, he's really a mathematician by now. He does uh, really beautiful things in mathematics, both numerical ideas and theoretical ideas. He's, he's a very uh, uh, a surprising person, and he's certainly now as much of a mathematician by anybody's standards as any uh, straight mathematician. But he is a physicist by training and by many, many papers. So his method is completely different. And so the fourth one, as I said, will be uh, Monin's method, which I believe from the quick error analysis, which I didn't do very carefully, for one thing, because he did it in his case, he had a different problem from this one. Uh, and he did it more carefully in that and with the error analysis, which I haven't done here. But roughly, it should be lambda the half. And the problem will actually be, let me write s as a functional. If f is some nice function, so f is a function on r, real, or it doesn't matter, real or complex value. You could split it into real and imaginary part. Let's say it's analytic and uh, should be fairly small. At, uh, I don't care. It's analytic. And for us, it will be even. There would be a variant if it's odd, but I'll assume it's even, and it vanishes at zero. So roughly, if I draw a picture of it, it'll look like, like this. And I don't really care. What, I don't care at all what it does at infinity. OK? And so s of f is going to be the infinite sum, k from 1 to infinity, f of 1 over k. Now, if you think about what I've already said, then you realize that something, see this looks like an euler maclaurin kind of a situation. I have a sum over half lattice, k positive, but it's not, because I'm assuming f is even. So instead of writing k positive, I could also write 1 half, the sum over k different from 0 of f of 1 over k. And so I'm basically summing over whole lattice, an analytic function, except that I haven't said anything about what this function does at infinity. So the function f of 1 over x near 0 could have an arbitrary horrible singularity. So you can't simply say, OK, I'll use Poisson summation. But still, morally, the fact that f is even means that this sum is much easier than if f were an odd function. So in our case, you can see that the original function, I've written it so many times now, I've erased it again. But it was the sum 1 over k. So what I called h of x was the sum 1 over k sine x over k. But of course, just as in things I did early in the course, the, thing to, the trick would be to multiply by x. And then this would be my function f of x over k, where here f of t would be t sine t, which is indeed an even function. So that will be the special case to which I'll apply the method. But the method is quite general. And so the question is, uh, compute this intelligently and quickly and accurately for a function where, uh, with the same problems that we had here, remember that when k is extremely large, there's no problem, because you're in the region where 1 over k is very small. The problem is when k is small, this function is jumping around at random if f is, for instance, oscillatory. If it's something really easy, like a polynomial, maybe you'd be OK. So the method is very surprising and very cute. So I'm, I'm glad that I will have time to tell it in this course, because it certainly fits in with asymptotic methods. And it's uh, a nice thing, not very well known, I assume. I wouldn't otherwise know it. 
So for all n greater than or equal to 0, I define two polynomials. And I'll call them cn of x and sn of x. That's supposed to remind you, as you'll see in a second, of cosine and sine of degree uh, at most n. And c of x is going to be an even polynomial, as cosine would be, and this will be an odd polynomial. So they can't degree exactly n. One of them will be exactly n. One will be exactly n minus 1. I'll give a little table in a second, but here's the exact definition. Cn of x is the sum minus 1 to the d, n minus d. d, this is the Pochhammer symbol, but I'll write it in a second with factorials, x to the 2d over 2d factorial, which I can also write as the sum j between 0 and n, j even, and then an alternating sign, cj I'll define in one second, uh, x to the j. So it's an even polynomial. And sn of x is going to be the sum 0 less than or equal to d less than, less than n over 2, so less than or equal to n minus 1 over 2, and then minus 1 to the d. There's, even if you're taking notes, which I hope you're not, there's no point writing down these formulas because I'll write down a more elegant one. I didn't even say which Pockerman symbol this is. But you can write the two uniformly. This is exactly the same thing, but now we're taking only the odd ones, j odd. And of course, then I don't want an i, so it's j minus 1 over 2. cj x to the j. And here's cj. Uh, well, the easiest way to write it is 2 to the j over j factorial times binomial coefficient n over j divided by binomial coefficient 2n over j. Obviously, you can cancel some factorials and simplify it, but that's the shortest way to write it. So these are some explicit polynomials. Uh, and they're extremely nice. They're extremely pretty polynomials with some really nice properties. So I'll take a minute to say how they look. So first, I'll give you a little table. So we have two of them for each n, c and s. So if it's 0, well, this one is e from the degree at most 0, so it's a constant. This is odd, so it's 0. The next one, this is e from the degree at most 1, so it's again a constant. This is odd, so it's got to be constant times x. For 2, this is 1 minus x squared over 3. And this one is x again. For 3, I don't know how far I'm going to go, but as long as so this is 1 minus 2x squared over 5. This is x minus x cubed over 15. For 4, this will be 1 minus 3 sevenths x squared plus x to the fourth over 105. And this one will be x minus 2x cubed over 21. And I'll do one more, just because there still aren't so many terms. 1 minus 4 ninths of x squared plus x to the fourth over 63, and x minus x cubed over 9 plus x to the fifth over 945. So these are very explicit polynomials. And you notice that you can compute this extremely easily just using the recursion, which is that cj plus 1, well, it's kind of trivial, is n minus j over n minus j over 2 times cj over j plus 1. So when you're actually computing this, you don't compute a bunch of binomial coefficients. We've had several forms like that earlier in the course. C0 is, of course, just 1. And then you just get each Cj from its predecessor by two or three multiplications and divisions. OK, so that's what we have. And now what do you do with these polynomials? And what you do is very surprising to me. It's, it's a kind of interpolation like Lagrange, Newton, all the various things that people know and we've discussed, but it's somehow different because we're using these strange polynomials. So let me erase all of this up to here. So I have some space. OK. So you fix n. Uh, well, let's say for fixed n, because I don't want to keep putting an n in the notation, so I'll just drop it. Uh, for fixed n, denote the zeros of Sn of x. Uh, I want to renormalize them by pi, so I'll call them pi xk. And remember, this is an even function. S 
well, s is an odd function, c is an even function, so the zeros will be one in the middle, and then they'll come symmetrically. So uh, I'm going to number them xk, and here absolute value of k would be less than or equal to, actually strictly less than n over 2, where obviously x0 is the middle one. It'll be 0, and x will be symmetric. x to the minus k is, uh, is minus xk, and they're simply in increasing order. OK, so I simply number them from, from let's say there are seven of them, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. So I number them. And I define weights. Again, k is fixed. Wk is the value of cn at this number divided by the derivative of sn. So this is the derivative, remember, pi xk is the root of sn. So this is the, like a pole term, it's a residue. And you'll see in a second, it is a residue, OK? And then one means approximation, which is really a pretty thing. His approximation to S of F, so we fix the N, is, and now Sn of F with these numbers is the sum, because it's even, and F is an even function, and F of 0 is 0, I just take the K strictly between 0 and N over 2. I take W of K, and I take 1 over X to the K. Except it's not quite right. It's almost right. There's an, it's correct. If n is odd, then you don't have to add anything. But if n is even, there's a small correction, but it's very easy. It's pi squared times c2 from that table, whatever c2 is, over n times n plus 1. So it's a somewhat not, obvious, not very obvious formula. OK? Uh, something seems a little strange about this. There should be a, maybe there's an, Oh, I didn't say what C2 is. It's, sorry, it's not those C2. So C2, where uh, f of x, remember f is even and analytic at the origin and in zero. So it starts, it is a power series expansion. Sorry, it had to depend linearly on f. C2 is the coefficient of, of x squared. Sorry, it's not the C2 of over there. OK, so except for this very trivial correction, you have to correct. Take the values at 1 over xk. So let's first look how this works and why it works. And then I'll tell you a little bit about where these zeros are, because that's very amusing. So roughly, you know, xk for a fixed k is going to be roughly 1 over k. And wk is going to be roughly 1 at the beginning, if, if k is small. And therefore, the first two few terms are just 1 times f of 1 over k. But then the further ones, you only take n over two terms, but you take them with clever weights. And these are somehow the best weights you can do. So that's his idea. So now I don't really want to erase even my table, because if I have to do it again. So remember, the claim is that this is roughly, this is an approximation to s of f, which I remind you, is the sum from 1 to infinity, f of 1 over k. OK, so that's what we're trying to do. So let me explain why, why it works. Why does this work? So why are we doing this? And then I'll explain a little bit where these numbers lie. So it's very nice. Remember the Cj were defined, the C, Cn and Sn of x were defined with the same sequence of coefficients, Cj, which were just this simple binomial thing. And then you took either the even ones or the odd ones. So for that, you get very trivially that if you take the generating function of the Cj, the minus sign, but I'm fixing my n. Remember, n is fixed in this lemma. So cj goes simply from 0 to n. Those are the ones I want. The even ones and the odd ones I'll use separately. So this is a polynomial. And that polynomial is going to be quite close to cj. And the identity, which is very easy to prove, it's the binomial coefficient minus a half over n inverse times the infinite sum, again, binomial coefficient p minus a half over n x to the p over p factorial. So that's an exercise I won't do. So this is exercise. OK. Now, if I replace in this x goes to i x and take the imaginary part, then what I'll get, if you remember with cn and sn are, they're the ones with minus 1 to the j for j even or minus 1 to the j minus 1 over 2. 
Uh, but then there's still an e to the ix from here. And so what you'll get, it looks like the additional law of cosine, cosine times sine minus sine times cosine. But it's, it's this. And what you'll get is the following exact formula, x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n minus 1 double factorial times the sum p from 0 to infinity minus x squared over 2 to the p over p factorial times 2n plus 2p plus 1 double factorial. You remember double factorial of an odd number is 1 times 3 times 5 up to that number. Okay, so these are just, this is an elementary exercise. But this thing is incredibly small when x is small and n is big because it's already, well, even if x is a bit big because of the 2n minus 1 double factorial. The first term here when p is 0 has another factorial. So this is roughly x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n minus 1 factorial, double factorial times 2n plus 1 double factorial. So it's incredibly small. So what this means is that these two polynomials are the best approximations. And in fact, they are the best approximations. So this calculation implies that the ratio cn of x over sn of x is a best, which means, if you know the theory, the Padé approximation to the function cosine over sine, which is cotangent of x. So Padé approximation, given any power series, uh, I think I used that once in this course when I talked about orthogonal polynomials. You can approximate it for each n by quotient of polynomials to degree at most n, and there's a best choice, and you get them from a continued fraction that you would have here too that I won't go into. And so these are the best. But once you have them, the proof that it's the best is that the order is x to the 2n plus 1. You can't do better than that. You have n coefficients here and n coefficients here, so you get 2n. So once you found stuff that works, you, you know you did it correctly. So these are the best approximations. And you see from this that indeed cn of x over sn of x is for x fixed and n large will be what I already said, x to the 2n, actually minus 1 over 2n minus 1 double factorial 2n plus 1 double factorial. And then there are further terms, I'll just write one of them, 2 times n plus 1 times 2n minus 3 over 3 times 2n minus 1 times 2n plus 3 x squared and so on, where this series eventually converges. So if x is large, this coefficient of the order of 1, then this term will be a little big, but it's still just polynomial size. And this is extremely small because of the two factorials. So this is the approximation. And now we're going to take Manin's approximation. And this is going to be, I don't know where I'll put it. Maybe I go over here now. We don't need these calculations at all anymore. In fact, I no longer really need the exact definitions. This was CN and SN. So if we take this sum, uh, Well, now there's a slight confusion with the k. But if I take here k less than n over 2, and then these weights, and I divide by some power, xk to the m, OK? Then by the residue theorem, remember these wk, I hope it's still written, xk were the roots. Well, it's not written, but uh, pi xk were the roots of the polynomial Sn, where k went from minus n over 2 to n over 2. And here I have the derivatives. So here, if I take xk to the minus m, then what this is, is it's a half because it should really be an even and odd. So sorry, this is not. This is 0 less than k less than n over 2. This would be the sum here over Sn of x is 0 but excluding the root at 0. And then it's cn of x over sn of x times x to the minus m. Because this thing is only simple poles. And the pole at xk, the value, the residue rather, is cn of xk divided by sn prime of xk, except there's a pi xk because of the way I normalized. And then I'm multiplying by xk to the m. And it's a half because here I'm taking positive and negative. But these are polynomials, and this upon this is a rational function. So the residue theorem says the sum of all of the residues is 0. So therefore, this is minus a half times the residue at x equals 0 
plus the residue at x equals infinity of c n of x divided by s n of x times x to the m. So this is my rational function, c n of x over s n of x, x to the m. And this is now an exact formula. Now, when I compute these residues, uh, the residue at infinity is very easy. Because see, this thing at infinity is roughly 1. This is a negative power. The only time that it's non-zero is if m is 1 and n is even. And then it's equal to 2 over n times n plus 1 times that derivative. And that's exactly what gives this correction term. So the correction term is just the residue at infinity. But the residue at x equals 0, so it's minus a half. The residue at x equals 0. But now we can use that c n of x is very close to cot of x. But this thing is just the coefficient. And so this is some binomial number. The exact version of that is uh, exactly minus 2 z of 2m. Well, if I put minus a half, there's no minus 2. It's simply z of 2m over pi to the 2m, mother of mistakes. So the residue at 0, if you could replace this rational function c n over s n by cotangent, that would be just z of 2m over x to the 2m. But you see, that's exactly what we want. Because remember, we're summing f of k, f of 1 over k, from 1 to infinity. So obviously, if f of x is the polynomial x to the 2m, then I'm getting exactly z of 2m. And there's an extra pi, because remember, I normalized the roots by a factor of pi. So you see, if I have an exact power, that would be on the nose. Uh, and so I would be this, this remaining number, this is exact. This is this little correction term. And this term would be exactly the residue of cn over sn divided by x to the m. But that's extremely close to this. And now the error, so the result is if m, so we're thinking of f originally as being just x to the 2m, where m is 1, 2, 3. OK, that would be an analytic function, even an analytic function which vanishes. As long as m is less than n, you get an exact formula. So this Sn will be exactly equal to s on the nose, because I haven't thrown away anything. And if m is greater than or equal to m, because I'm taking the coefficient, remember the difference between Cn over Sn and cotangent is O of x roughly the 2n, 2n minus 1. And therefore, if maybe this is 2m. Probably it's 2m by now. Well, this is m, but it has to be even, I think. I probably messed up. Yeah, I want only even powers, I think. So m should be an even number. You could call it 2m. Yeah, so here it's 2m. Uh, so I need, if, as long as this is bigger than that, then, of course, there is no coefficient at all, because the power series only starts next to the 2n. So if m is less than n, it's exact. But for instance, if m is equal to n, then the error is 1 over 2n minus 1, the same number we had, a product of two double factorials. That would be the error. So I mean, you have to do a detailed error analysis, but you can see it's incredibly accurate. And so you get this very surprising form that the infinite sum, well, there's this stupid correction term if, if uh, just coming from the x squared term that you can ignore. But uh, otherwise, you just take the sum, but instead of f of 1 over k with weights 1, you take 1 over f of xk with weight uh, w. So the last thing I have to tell you, and I still have a few minutes, and I won't need them all, maybe five minutes, is how do these zeros look? Where are they, and how are the weights? OK. Well, the weights tend rapidly to 1. I think I don't even have them written down. But where are the, so where are the zeros? So remember, they were x0, which is 0, plus or minus 1 x1, up to plus or minus x to the n minus 1 over 2 of Sn of, I guess it's pi x. I guess it was you know, pi x. So those are the things. And so what you find is that up to, for small k, k small, and experimentally, I haven't re really tested this, so up to around n over 3, xk is very close to k, as of course it has to be. The method couldn't possibly work, and we just showed that it works. If in the limit, 
the individual terms, after all, f is anything it wants to be. These individual numbers better be f of 1 over k with weight 1. So of course, the xk better be close to k, and the weight better be close to 1. But you'll see in a second that they're extremely close, and they're actually all the way up to about n over 3. They're still close. And I find this also quite surprising. So let me give you a little table. So here's a table. I, I have lots of digits here in my notes, but I'll only give you a bit of it. This is s 100 of x. So k will go from 1 to 50. So I'll take 1, 2, 3, 10, 20, 30, 31, and then I'll continue on the next column. So here, I have lots of dead salt, but I'll just put the main term. The first zero, next to zero. I mean, of course, x0 is exactly zero. We know that. It's, it's even. x1 for 100 is 1 plus 3 times 10 to the minus 288. That's kind of nifty. So when I say it's close, it's essentially equal. So the first few terms are that. The next one is 2 plus 8 times 10 to the minus 217. So we've already lost 70 digits. The next is 3 plus 2 times 10 to the minus 181. For 10, it's 10 plus 2 times 10 to the minus 78, but it's still extremely close. For 20, it's 20 plus 9 times 10 to the minus 25. For 30, it's 30.007. Suddenly, it's no longer incredibly close. 31, it's 31.0507. And if I continue, so that was 31. I'll do 32, 33, 34, and then I'll skip to the last few. Remember, it ends at 49 because it's n minus 1, n, n over 2, strictly smaller. So here, it's 32.2. Here, it's 33.55. So it's it's no longer really little o of 1. Here it's already, for 34, it's already bigger than 35. So as I said, it goes roughly up to n over 3. And then the last few, I'll just give the original, the, up to the, I can put more digits, 103, 128, 171, 256, and 511. You can see the last one is like, you know, it's, it's huge. So, uh, so that's how the actual zeros look, but the weights are going to be such that these Last ones we aren't going to care about, or at least I assume they're like that. But the amusing thing here is that you get that they're so strictly glued to where they should be. That, of course, has to do with the Padé approximation, that it's cosine over sine. And sine, of course, is exactly at the integers. So in fact, if k is much smaller than n, I don't know how much smaller it has to be, then you can do an exact asymptotics. I did this numerically, but you could certainly prove it. Well, you can do the numerics by the method I showed many times in this course. And that's what I did. But you could certainly prove it in this case. So the small zeros, if you fix a zero, that would be like you know x3. Then it's k plus something very small. And something very small is pi k over 2 to the 2n plus 1 over n factorial squared times 1 minus capital K plus 1 over 4n plus k squared. I mean, I have more terms. I'll just give you these. 6k plus 5 over 32n squared, and so on. So where k capital K is 2K squared, pi squared. So roughly, if, if K squared is less than N, then, then you're extremely close. And in the opposite direction, at the other end, uh, K roughly N over 2, the biggest XK, if N is even, then the biggest XK maximum, um, the, it's our K maximum, so which is N over 2 minus 1, is Again, this is experimental, but you could certainly prove it. It grows roughly quadratically, as we just saw. It was 500, remember, when n was 1,000. 500 of 2 pi squared. And if n is odd, it's the same. No, it's not the same. It's over pi squared plus a 12th plus O of 1 over n squared if n is even. So, so the last uh, value is, is much bigger than n. And there's actually an asymptotic formula if I take one very near the end, but I'm not going to bother to write it out. So there's a formula if you have x to the power n minus j over 2, then there's an exact asymptotic formula also. So well, that's the end of this method. It's the end of today's lecture, and it's over the end of the course. 
I gave four very different methods for studying the same problem. None of them is terribly important, and the problem isn't terribly important, but it's to show the kind of a variety of methods you can use to study you know, awkward sums, and each of these methods could be used in other contexts. Maybe I'll take a minute, since I still have four, to say what the problem was that Monin was originally studying, and that he wrote a paper on using this method, and I'll just say it very quickly because it also makes a nice exercise if you want to test your knowledge of the uh, you know, asymptotic method. So we define some so-called Hankel determinants. So these are determinants of a very special form. And I'm going to define them slightly differently for even and odd numbers. So you take the zeta values. Well, I don't have to put it in. It's clear. So it's a matrix. You take zeta of 2, zeta of 3, up to zeta of n. And here's, well, it's symmetric, so n up to 2n minus 2, if n is even, uh, 2n minus 1 is odd, rather. And if 2n is even, you start at z of 3, z of 4 up to z of n plus 1. And here's z of n plus 1 up to z of 2n minus 1. And not very surprisingly, these numbers are very small, because after all, to exponentially close, all the zetas are 1. So this matrix is, you know, all 1s that we certainly have determined at 0. But it's extremely close, so I'll give you just, I'm not going to write out I have all the numbers here, but delta 100, for instance, is 3.4 times 10 to the minus, anybody want to guess how small is small? 3,371, which means it's only, you know, Paris will happily compute theta values, and it'll happily compute a 100 by 100 determinant. But the problem is to compute this one, you have to compute the individual numbers to more than 3,400 3, digits. Because each product, you know, you have n factorial products with signs, and each product is of the order of 1. But the sum of all of them is of the order of 10 to the minus 3,400. So it's already numerically a bit tricky. And uh, well, maybe I'll just leave it completely as an exercise. So exercise, I'll only give you a hint. Uh, Exercise, delta n is asymptotic to what? And the only hint is that it's different formulas if n is odd and n is even. So when you do this on the computer and you try to interpolate using the interpolation method I showed you, if you compare n and n plus 1, you'll get into a mess. You better compare n and n plus 2. So that's a small hint. But I won't say, but of course, this gives you a certain hint. It's certainly more than exponentially small. In fact, it's more than factorially small. It's like really small, OK? So factorial would be like n to the n. This, this goes to, to zero even much faster than that. So the question is to prove that what Monin actually wanted is not just the determinant of this, which is the product of its eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are real. It's a real symmetric matrix. He wanted the information about all the eigenvalues. I studied it a lot. I have 10 pages of notes. It was all experimental. I couldn't prove much of anything, but there were all kinds of beautiful things about the behavior of these eigenvalues, and it's another fun problem. So if anybody's looking for a fun thing too, but it's been basically solved by Modine in that paper a dozen years ago. But it's a very nice problem, and I wanted to end with one beautiful arithmetic thing. So the fact that these determinants are so incredibly small. Of course, if you want, I'm, I can happily write down the correct asymptotics. But let's say up to, so up to order, so uh, let's say up to order, relative order, so multiplicative factor 1 plus O, so something, times, let's say, 1 of n to the fourth. So you know, give uh, several terms of the asymptotic expansion. So, oh, actually, it's, no, I went further. It's n to the 11. In fact, I can tell you that after you take out the prefactor, it's an even power series of 1 over n squared. So that would only be like five or six terms. So if anybody wants to test their skills now with very tricky numerical analysis. That's a good one to do, and it's a good exercise in Paris. OK, so I'm all finished. It's exactly 3.30. If anybody has a question, including people, those who are left on Zoom.